So, we have always said public keys are public, but we now have this issue, well, how do we really distribute them such that we know we've got the right one? It's not someone pretending to be a user. Well, different approaches, public announcement, yell it out. So what I do, I generate my public key, and while we're in the class, I read out the values, or maybe a signature of the values. You download my public key, I read out the values, and you confirm, because you see it's me, you trust it's me, and see that that, that is my public key. Now you know that you have my public key. So some form of announcement. That works on a small scale when you're physically close to people, but it doesn't work on a large scale and across a large area. Have some form of directory, like a website, where everyone uploads their public key, and when you want to get someone's public key, you go to that website and download it, but we have that problem, how do we trust that the attacker hasn't modified the values on the website? And then we'll see two more secure ways, a public key authority and public key certificate. Public announcements just send the public key across the network. But we saw with the simple key distribution scheme that doesn't work because of a man in the middle attack. If user A sends its public key to B, there's no way for B to know for sure that it's got A's public key. It could have been an attacker in the middle. So that's the problem with that approach. Now, the announcement may be done via a network, it may be via old means of publishing an, on an email or a website or a newspaper. Maybe a little bit more automatic, use some special directory where you publish the public keys in the directory in advance. And when you want to, let's say B wants to learn A's public key, it contacts the directory and downloads A's public key. But same problem we have, how, do we, how does B know that it's got A's public key? We need some form of authentication. So we'll arrive at using an authority. What we'll do is that each user has their own key pair. They're going to publish their public keys in the directory and the directory we'll call here the authority, the public key authority. And when a user wants to communicate with someone else, let's say A wants to talk to B, A will contact the directory, or the authority here, and say, give me the public key of B. A will contact B, and B will also need the public key of A, so it will contact the authority saying, give me the public key of A be able to get the public key of A, and then they'll do some final authentication steps to check that they're communicating with the right entity. This can happen automatically. So this is a protocol that can be run between the different computers involved. So whenever A wants to talk to B, it, we go through these seven steps. <coughs> we'll go through them in some depth, look at the messages, and look at the some of the design issues here, some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of doing this. Remember the aim is that A knows B's public key and also B knows A's public key. If we know the public keys and we're sure they are the correct public keys, then we can use them to exchange secrets or whatever else we want to do later. The aim is to exchange public keys. Let's go through the steps and, and keep track of what, what we know and what we learn along the way. Wrong one. First we'll list what is known by the entities before any of the messages are exchanged. So A wants to talk to B, we're going to exchange these seven messages, but before that we assume that A knows some information, B knows some information, and also the authority. 
What do they know at the start? Well, everyone knows their own key pair. That's the first thing. So we'll list that A knows the public key of A and the private key of A. B knows its own key pair. And the authority also has its own key pair. So we assume they know their own key pair. But also, before any of the exchange takes place, we'll assume that the users have all published their public key to the authority. That is, the authority also knows PUA and PUB. And they are the correct public keys. An example being, I'm the authority, and every student comes to my office, they show me their ID, I confirm it's them, and they show me or electronically give me their, their public key, and as the authority I store that in some database. So the authority knows the public key of A and the public key of B. Our aim is for A to know the public key of B and B to know the public key of A. What else? When A went to the authority and gave the authority its public key, the authority gave A the public key of the authority. So at the start, A also knows PU of the authority. And so does B. I'll just list that here. In other words, every user must exchange their public key with the authority before this works. If we have a million users, they must all exchange with the authority. Now this scales okay because as you increase the number of users, the, the number of initial exchanges increases linearly. So this centralized scheme like the KDC, we need one manual exchange per user. But that must take place securely in advance. So now, what we want to do is A, communicate with any other user, in this case B. And we want to do that automatically because, let's say we have 100 users. If there are 100 users, there were 100 manual exchange with the authority. A exchange with the authority, B with the authority, and the 100 users all did it centrally to the authority, 100 manual exchanges. But now we want to allow any user to communicate with any other user. They all need to do an exchange. How many possible exchanges are there? If we have 100 users, how many pairs of users are there? If you remember from two weeks ago, anyone remember the equation? If you have 100 users, how many pairs are there between them? 4,450. 100 times 99 divided by 2. So about almost 5,000. Okay. So the reason we can use manual exchange with the authority in this case is because we only have uh, 100 to do to <coughs> manually. But if we wanted to do manual exchange between the users, we'd have almost 5,000 exchanges, many more. And that becomes uh, too inconvenient. So that's say, it's okay to manual exchange with authority, but not between users. Hence we use this protocol of seven steps to exchange between users. First step. A sends a message to the authority, some form of request. It doesn't say in this picture what the request is, but maybe it contains the identity of A and B. So we just say a request. Think the request is saying, I'm requesting the 
public key of B. So the request actually may contain at least the ID of A and the ID of B. What's T1? A timestamp. So we send a request to the authority, I'm user A, saying, I want to learn the public key of B. And so that request should contain my identity, I am user A, the identity of that entity I want to communicate with, B, and a timestamp, T1, we don't know here, saying, this request came at this particular time. Why do we have a timestamp? What's the general type of attack we try to defeat with timestamps? What's the name of the attack? Replay attacks uh, are hard to perform if there's a timestamp. We send uh, this message now. We include the current time. Very accurate. If someone resends this message, five minutes later, the receiver can easily detect, ah, this has been delayed by five minutes or it's been replayed. Let's not trust this resent message. Okay, so it provides some, uh, some information to the authority that this is a current message. And also we'll see it, it comes back in the response, so the A knows that the response, message two, corresponds to a response to the initial request. So it's like some sequence counter or some uh, uh, value that the receiver can check that it's not an old message or a replay of a message. It's a request for the public key of B. The authority has the public key of B, so it sends back the public key of B, but we can't send it unauthenticated. If we send a public key unauthenticated, someone could intercept it and modify it. So we see we authenticate that message, the public key of B, including the original request, ID A, ID B, and the same timestamp, and we encrypt that with the private key of the authority. Encrypting with a private key is signing, really. We sign the message, or the authority signs this message, confirming this came from the authority. When user A receives message 2, what do they do? Decrypt, and the name of that process of decrypting we call, starts with a V. We verify. So we say that the authority signs the public key of B, how did they sign it? They encrypted with the private key of the authority. When A receives a signed message, they verify. To verify, you decrypt with the public key of the sender. And we said that A already has the public key of the authority, so they can verify that this is indeed the, a message that came from the authority. When A receives message 2, they verify the message using the public key of the authority. They find it passes the verification because it was encrypted with the private key of the authority. It successfully decrypts with the public key of the authority. Therefore, verification passes. So they know the contents included are valid. They've learned PUB. So that's the first discovery of a message and as a result of that, after message 2, we know PUB. A knows PUB. Remember our aim, A to learn PUB, B to learn PUA. before we look at the next steps. What if an attacker intercepted message 2? What could they do? Yeah, 
Right. If an attacker intercepts message 2, they can learn the public key of B. Remember, message 2 is encrypted with the private key of the authority. Everyone knows the public key of the authority. It's public. So this does not provide confidentiality. Anyone can see the public key of B. So the attacker can learn PUB, they can learn the request and T1. So what? They learn the public key of B. We know that that's okay because it's the public key. Can they try to modify anything? They intercept message 2 and they're trying to trick user A and to get a different public key. They change PUB to PUI, the public key of the imposter. Will it work? Yes, it will work. They intercept, they can learn PUB, they can change PUB to something else, but when they send that modified message onto A, what is A going to do? A is going to verify using the public key of the authority. Any message we receive from the authority, the second one, we verify with the public key of the authority and it will only pass verification if it was encrypted with the private key of the authority. Therefore, if an imposter tries to modify this message to along the way, they can't encrypt it with the private key of the authority because they don't have it. They need to encrypt with some other private key, but when we try to verify with the public key of the authority, it would fail the verification. So, encrypting with the private key of the authority means that if someone tries to modify it, A will detect that modification. And that's our authentication. That's how A knows it's got the public key of B. It hasn't been modified. Any questions about the first two steps? It's just to get PUB to A. I asked for it. Authority sends it to me, but importantly, it sends it to me signed by the authority. We want to exchange public keys, so we keep going. A knows the public key of B. Now A contacts B for the first time, sending a message to B saying, let's communicate, let's talk. It uses the public key of B to encrypt its own identity and a nonce value, again a random value or some number that will only be used once and is hard to predict by an attacker. It's encrypted with the public key of B, therefore no one else can decrypt that message except B. Only B can decrypt this message. So if an attacker intercepts message 3, they cannot learn N1. B receives this, realises that A wants to talk to it. Step 4 and 5 are similar to step 1 and 2. B now requests the public key of A from the authority the authority sends back a response containing the public key of A signed by the authority. B confirms and learns PUA. It verifies message 5 and learns PUA. So just to make that clear, that the steps that are important here the public key authority signs this message and when A receives it verifies. And similar with message 5, it's signed by the authority and when B receives, it verifies. The way that it verifies is using the public key of the authority, which we assumed was known at the start. After message 5, 
we've achieved our aim. A knows the public key of B, B knows the public key of A, but we still have message 6 and 7 and they are used to, to confirm that there are no replay attacks or no modifications uh, along the way. Like in the previous protocol where we want to be sure that we're talking with the right entity. Message 3 contained N1. The only person who knows N1 is A. Let's say some random value. Message 6 coming from B also must contain N1. If it contains the correct N1, then it confirms that B uh, was able to decrypt message 3, which confirms that message 6 comes from B. If you can decrypt message 3, you must be B. B also includes N2 in message 6, and A sends back that same N2 in message 7. So when B receives message 7, it knows it's talking to A. So really 3, 6 and 7, are A and B checking, are we talking with the right entity? We'll just jump back to one of the previous systems. 1, 2 and 3. Uh, the purpose of those three messages is for A and B to confirm they're talking with the right entity. It's exactly the same purpose as 3, 6 and 7 here. If you look closely, they're using almost the same technique. They send the nonce values uh, encrypted with the other entity's public key. questions on how do we use a public key authority to exchange public keys. Correct. All, all of this assumes that the authority is trustworthy. That is. So at this, so we're assuming that somehow before we did all this, we have confirmed that it's the right authority. This is this manual exchange. So, uh, right. It could be that, in in the example that I said, you are the users. I am the authority. You trust me as a lecturer. Uh, at the start of the semester, you come to my office, we provide some ID, we do a manual exchange, and I learn your public key, you learn mine as the authority. Then after that, all semester, we can use this protocol and each student can talk to each other student using this protocol by automatically exchanging public keys. But yes, we don't overcome this problem of we must trust someone because we need to get started somewhere. If we want to exchange a shared secret key across a network, then it must be encrypted. If we are going to encrypt it, we must have a key to encrypt it. Well, we can use public keys, but our problem always with public keys, we must know it's the right public key. And the only way to cryptographically do that is to have it signed by someone but if we sign a message, we must have a public key to verify that message. So there must be some initial trust. There's no way around that here. In this case, the initial trust is A trusts the authority. When I say trust here, I mean A has the public key of the authority and it knows for sure it's the correct one. And that issue is a practical issue, that is, how do we trust other entities? 
Maybe you trust a government or you trust your employer. They, they set up the system in advance such that we uh, have that initial trust built into the software or into the, the system. We'll see that a little bit more with web security and digital certificates. So let's summarise on the scheme here. The aim, A and B get public keys. The assumptions, every user trusts the authority and they've exchanged public keys with the authority. That must be done manually in advance. The automatic steps, request the public key of B, receive the signed public key of B from the authority in message 2. A verifies the signature of message 2 using the public key of the authority. Message 3 is telling B that A wants to talk to it. So B does the same as message 1 and 2. It requests A's public key from the authority. The authority sends A's public key back, but signed. B verifies message 5. Okay, it learns the public key of A. 3, 6 and 7 combined are uh, A and B checking. Are we talking with the right entity? With this exchange, there's no way for an attacker in the middle to modify a message and try and pretend to be one of the others. For an attacker to pretend to be B from A's perspective or vice versa. Because these messages are encrypted with public keys, we have confidentially confidentiality of those messages and because the contents are random numbers or nonce values the attacker cannot guess what they are in advance. What's the problem with this? We trust the authority is one problem. We'll see we can't get around that if we want to use a centralized approach. What's another problem? Maybe not a security problem. Performance. Why is performance a problem? There are seven, seven messages to be sent across the network to, to do this. Every time a pair of users want to communicate, they exchange these seven messages. So there is some communications overhead, usually not large. Uh, let's say we need to do this every five minutes. A wants to communicate with someone else, they go through these seven steps, just send some packets across the network, software does it for us. But maybe performance with respect to the authority can be an issue. The authority is like a server. A and B are computers in the network. Every time any computer wants to talk to any other computer, we see the authority must receive a request, sign a public key and send it back. Twice, in fact. So there's some load on this authority. It must sign two messages for every time a pair of entities want to communicate. If we have thousands of users wanting to communicate, there are many requests coming to the authority and the authority has to sign those requests and send them back. So there's some performance bottleneck at the authority. If this is slow, if it can't respond quickly for a response, then the communications between the users will be delayed. So yes, some performance issue with the authority, it's, we depend upon that, and also some trust issue with the authority. We can't overcome the trust issue. We must trust someone to get started. We can overcome the performance issue. So we looked at using the authority to distribute public keys. The authority can be the performance bottleneck. Everything goes through that entity, that server. If it's slow, the whole system is slow. You can speed things up by caching some of the messages. The way to overcome that every exchange goes to the authority is to use a concept called public key certificates. 